Good morning. Everybody is quieting down, so I guess that's our cue to go ahead and get going. So we're excited, whether you're here in person or joining us online this morning. We're so glad to have you here to worship with us. Uh, if you are visiting in person with us, if you wouldn't mind, in the pew in front of you, you'll find a welcome card. If you wouldn't mind just taking a moment, filling that out, and then as you leave, you can drop that in one of the offering boxes. We always love to have a record of who is here. Uh, it's also a good way for you to communicate with us and us to communicate with you. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about what's happening at the church, if you need prayer, uh, you can always put that on there as well. And if you're watching online, go ahead and leave a like or a comment on there uh, so that we can see and know that you were there as well. Our scripture reading comes from uh, Psalm 84 and verses 1 and 2 this morning. It says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies! I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord with my whole being, body, and soul. I will shout joyfully to the living God. Will you pray with me this morning? God, we do just give thanks for all that you have done and all that you are doing in each and every one of our lives, Lord. And we thank you that we could come here into your house this morning to worship you, um, whether it's through the songs that we're going to sing, through the prayer time as we pray uh, individually and as a group here this morning, Lord, and as you speak to us through the message uh, through Pastor Carter this morning, Lord. I pray that you would just be moving and working in each of our lives, Lord, that we could uh, say that that is true, that we are joyfully uh, singing and worshiping and praising you here this morning, Lord. And we just thank you that we could do that uh, together as the body of Christ. And we just ask that you would do a mighty work here this morning, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. morning. Let's more or less start off with Here I Am to Worship, hymn number 130. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, Glorious in heaven above, humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. To God be the glory, number 28. To God be the 
glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon received. Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he had taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. And his eye is on the sparrow, number 93. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when she is my portion, my constant friend is he, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender words I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubt and fear. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, his eye is on the spell. And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. 
I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him from I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on. I know he watches me. Hey. Whenever we sing that song, it uh, reminds me of Larnell Harris. When we were younger, we had uh, somebody gave us a cassette tape of Larnell Harris, and that kind of dates me there, right? Cassette tapes, and we played that there in the car, and uh, we'd kind of wear that one out, and uh, he'd sing that song there, His Eyes on the Sparrow. I think what a wonderful truth it is just to remind us there uh, of that time. Uh, whatever we're going through, if God's eye is on the sparrow, he cares about the sparrows, how much more does he care for us? Amen. And so with that, let's go to Lord in prayer uh, together today. God, we are grateful to be able to be here today and just to be able to worship you. And God, we know that you are worthy of all worship. Lord, as we come today, we know that we come with often different cares that are weighing on our hearts. We think of those loved ones uh, that are wrestling with illness. We think particularly of those that are wrestling with COVID and some that are, have been wrestling for a long time there with the COVID. Lord, we ask that you'd reach down and touch, that you would heal their bodies there. Lord, we pray for the families that are caring for them, that you would strengthen them and give them the energy, the strength, and the wisdom that they need, Lord. Lord, we uh, pray for those that have lost relatives here uh, recently, Lord. Um, we ask that you would just comfort them, that you would be with them during this time of loss, that you would uh, provide the peace and the comfort that only you can do. But Lord, we look to you this morning. We know that our strength comes from you and that, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us, that you would bless us, that you would encourage us by having been together here in your house today and having been together with your people, that, Lord, that you'd give us the strength that we need. Draw us close to you today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, we are uh, turning to Judges chapter 6 this morning. And uh, we'll be continuing our, our kind of look there at the life of Gideon as we're looking here at Gideon. Uh, we're asking that question of who are you and understanding that it is uh, out of our identity that our behavior is often driven. Uh, who we think we are, what we identify, or who we identify there, often there. Uh, and so to understand that, you may remember maybe when you were younger, maybe as a teenager there, you were getting ready to go out of the house, and uh, maybe your parents said something like, remember your last name, or remember whose child you are. And uh, what they were not saying, right, they were not saying, like, don't forget, like, you've got a last name and make sure you know how to spell that last name and, you know, you might have to write it on the paper. No. What were they saying when they said that? They said that uh, because you are our child, there is certain expectations, there are certain behaviors that you are expected to do and certain ones that you are expected not to do. And we don't want to hear that you're doing the ones you're not supposed to do. And we do want to hear that you're doing the thing. Uh, there was out of that identity of who you were, of who your family was, of who your name was, there was an uh, expectation of what you were to do. We understand that, and so oftentimes we understand then that our 
behavior of what we do is often driven by who we think we are. And that's important as we come here to take a look at Gideon, uh, Gideon sorry, Judges chapter 6 when you look at this. And, and one of the things I, I hope that as we note, read this passage this morning, you notice this wonderful irony that's taking place here uh, within the passage. And uh, it is, uh, you have to know that God has a sense of humor as you read here in Judges chapter 6. And so Judges chapter 6, they're starting there in verse 11. And so uh, last week we took the opportunity to look at the consequences of sin. We looked at the idea there that when they had sown, right, uh, there, um, verse 3, and so it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up. We know that they had sown sin, they reaped the affliction that sin brings with it. They had come to that point of hardship where they had cried out to God, and God now had sent the prophet, and the prophet had reminded them there to repent and to return to God. While God is sending the prophet, God is also preparing a deliverer. And so here in verse 11, it says this, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, uh, belonging to Joash the Abizarite, uh, and his son Gideon threshed wheat in the white press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all those miracles which has told us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? And uh, But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent you? And he said, uh, Then he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest of Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that you shall. Uh, that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And so he said, I will wait till you come back. And so Gideon went in and he prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and he brought it out to him under the terebinth tree and he presented it to him. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay it on this rock. And so pour out the broth. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat, the unleavened bread, and the fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat, the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. So Gideon built an angel, uh, built an altar to the Lord and called it, The Lord is peace. To this day, it is still there in Ophrah of the Abizarites. As we come to this passage, uh, it's interesting as we take a look at this, so there are some things that we see, first of all, about Gideon and what Gideon thought about himself and then who God was. And so as we look at this passage, I think one of the the, the fun things we see about this passage is where do we find Gideon in this passage? Now, we've looked at the history. The history of this is uh, that the uh, Midianites and the Amalekites both were oppressing the nation of Israel. Uh, and they would come in, and whenever it was harvest time, they would just come in, and the raiders would come in and just basically take whatever they had. Uh, whatever their grain was, they would try and hide it in the caves. Uh, they would try and hide that. They would come, they would find that. They would steal that. Their uh, livestock, they would come and steal that. And so they had left them in an impoverished situation. And so it is coming now towards harvest time. Uh, Gideon and his family have planted their farm. Uh, they're uh, about time to harvest it. Uh, and so where do we find Gideon, right? The, the angel of the Lord comes, sits underneath the terebinth tree, and, and there in verse 11, and, um, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in a wine press in order to hide it. Now, that probably doesn't mean a whole lot to us today. Until you begin to look at some of the ancient customs of uh, how they would harvest. And so uh, today, if you have a farm, uh, you probably have a lot of equipment on that farm. And one of the things you probably have is a combine. 
And when it comes time for harvest time, whether you're harvesting corn or soy or wheat, uh, you'll get at combine, you'll put the right head on the combine, you'll take the combine out in the field, and uh, you'll just go around and you'll you know, get the grain truck, you'll put the grain in the grain truck, that combine does all the work for us, right? You, it, it, those new combines are almost so great nowadays, you can almost get in, program the uh, thing, and just kind of take your hands off the wheel and let it do the work. Uh, they do all the work. But in those days, they would have to cut down the wheat. Then they would have to take that wheat. They'd take it on carts or uh, the people would carry the, the shocks of it. They would take it to the threshing floor. Uh, and the threshing floor was always at the highest point because you wanted the threshing floor to be able to catch the wind. Uh, they would then take either staves or, or rods that they would have or they would take oxen. And those oxen would crush the wheat that's in the head so that they could separate the grain, the kernel of grain from the chaff or that protective layer around outside the wheat as well as the stalk there. Uh, once they would crush that, then they would take shovels or forks, winnowing forks, and they would toss that up in the air. And what would happen is the breeze would catch the, the chaff, the lighter, uh, of the, the outside husk of the wheat, as well as the, the stalks, and it would carry that away with the wind, and the, the grain, the kernel of grain, being heavier, would fall down. And after you've done this process for a period of time, you would then take up, scoop up all what was left, the grain, and you would bag that up, and you would keep that for the next year. So you would always want to place that up on top. Well, where do we find Gideon? Where we find Gideon is this, is we find Gideon down at the bottom. And it reminds us of this truth, right? That when we focus on what is happening around us, we become afraid. Where do we find Gideon? We find Gideon in the wine press. You see, the wine press was just the opposite of the threshing floor. The threshing floor would always be up at the top of the hill. The wine press would be at the bottom of the hill because grapes were heavy, and you didn't want to carry grapes uphill. You'd want to carry grapes downhill, and you would crush grapes, and they would always, because the juice always runs to the lowest point, you would want to make sure it was down there at the bottom. You would crush grapes, put it there at the bottom. Gideon is not up at the top threshing floor. He's down at the bottom in the wine press. And I, I hope I have this picture. Right? Oh, maybe I don't have the picture here. forgot to put the picture in. Uh, if you were to look at that picture of the wine press, the wine press is a large hole in the ground with another smaller hole in the middle. They would dump the grapes into the large hole. They would stomp them, usually with their own feet. You know, I, I, You'd have to enjoy the, the grape juice that would come out of that. Uh, but they would stomp it there with their own feet as they would crush the grapes. And then that would go down uh, there into the lower place where they would then put that into pots that they would then store in pots. Uh, it's not the optimal place for threshing wheat because there is no wind that catches it, right? You're down below the ground. Why is he down there? He's down there because he's hiding from the Midianites. This is... The great, brave, courageous Gideon that we find, just in case there might be Midianite raiders that are out there, he's hiding. He, and he's probably doing it as quietly as possible. He's not using the oxen. Uh, that would get it done a lot more efficiently and a lot faster. He's, he's got the rod and the staff that he's beating this out, and just a little bit at a time. And he's doing it just because he's afraid if the Midianites find them threshing wheat, they'll steal that wheat. When we focus on what's going on around us, we are consumed with fear. Now, I don't know about you, but it's not hard to focus on what's going on around us. Uh, any night, no matter of fact, any day now, we've got the 24-hour news cycle. You can watch the news, uh, and you can find out what's going on around us. You can listen to what people are, are talking about and the things that are disturbing people. And when we focus on our circumstance and our situation, we're tempted to become afraid. Gideon was acting out of fear because he was focusing on his strength. He was looking to say, what do I have the ability to do? And I, I can't you know, repel the, the, Gideon, the Midianites, and I, I'm not an army in and of myself. I can only do this little bit. And so he was acting out of fear. Now, it challenges me as uh, the pastor of the church to ask this question. Are we, as a church, harvesting in a wine press? You say, what, what do you mean by that, Pastor? What do you mean, harvesting a wine press? I, I'm asking the question, are we often afraid of the world around us, and so we uh, dial back what we're doing because we're afraid of the world around us? We look at the things that are happening in the world, and we're consumed by the fear. Uh, I, I, 
COVID is the big thing that's in our news and in our minds. Are we dialing back what we do because of COVID? Are we, are we dialing back because of lawsuits? You know, if we do that, you know, somebody might come in and they might sue us and we don't want, we don't want to lose this. And Are we dialing it back because of culture? You know, culture has changed so much. We don't want to be offensive to our neighbors. And, and so, you know, maybe we shouldn't like say those type of things anymore. Or maybe because people are changing, do we dial back because we're focusing on what's around us rather than on focusing on God and upon who he is? Gideon was looking at his circumstance when he considered himself in his circumstance. His response was a response of fear. He was afraid. And so he, you notice he didn't say, I'm not going to thresh. He said, we, we've got to have grain, but I'm going to do it in a place that nobody will see me. And I'll kind of just do it in this kind of like nice little quiet corner. And I won't disturb anybody with this. And we thresh in a wine press. Rather than being consumed with our problems, we need to put our focus there on God. And it's interesting, right, because Gideon, is not that he didn't have a mind for God, right? Notice what he said. The angel of the Lord comes to him, and we're going to come to this part in just a moment. He says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And then what's Gideon's response, right? Gideon, uh, God's just given him this great boost of confidence, and Gideon's response is, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And then, notice what he goes on to say, and where are all the miracles which our fathers have told us about did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now he's forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of Egypt. The second thing we see here is this. Gideon is focusing on the past rather than on the present. He's saying God is a God of the past. Look, all these great things God did in the past. Man, man all those miracles and, and God is moving and working. And God did all those great things in the past, but he's, just, he's not working today. Again, sometimes we as churches are often tempted to look back at the past and romanticize the past. And I remember back when Pastor So-and-so was here, man, it was just like, we was booming and packed and all these things. But we need to realize this, God is not just God of the past, God is also God of the present. He is not limited by our present circumstances. We may be, God is not. It also reminds me here of this third truth, right? God is big enough for us to ask our hard questions. Sometimes when we get into the situation that Gideon is and we're afraid, or we're unsure what to do, Truth be told, we get angry and upset with God. And yet somehow we think that God is just this like really sensitive God that if I tell God how I'm feeling, he might get mad at me. And so we pretend that everything is okay even when everything is not okay. Notice this, God did not get angry with Gideon because Gideon said, where is God? God's the God of the past. He's not God of the present. He's not helping us. He's abandoned us today. Where is God today? God didn't get angry with him. We have a God that is big enough. If you've got some questions that you're wrestling with that are big questions, maybe you're saying, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even really sure God's there. I'm not even sure really God loves me. I don't. Hey, bring those to God. God is big enough to handle those. He does not get afraid of those. He does not run away or turn away from you. God didn't say to Gideon, Gideon, that was the wrong question. Too bad for you. Strike you off the list. I'm going to the next person now. No, he continued to work with Gideon. We serve a God who is big enough. And the second thing that we look about as we look at this is that we are tempted to believe the lies that Satan says about us. This is one of the things I appreciate when you come here to the story of Gideon. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, right? In verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, this is why I say God has a wonderful sense of humor. So where is Gideon? Gideon is in the wine press, threshing out of fear, and God says to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Matter of fact, this is the same idea of the idea of hero, right? Like you are God's hero chosen for this job, and, and you're like, uh, are you sure you got the right guy? And so Gideon responds, where is God? And God says, I'm going to call you uh, to deliver the people of uh, Israel. And notice what Gideon's response there in verse 15. And he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest of Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. You begin to see the identity that Gideon has about himself that he's based both on the circumstances that are around him and the lies that he's been told there by Satan. We know that Satan is a liar and the father of them. And he tells lies about who we are so that he'll keep us from serving Jesus Christ. Gideon has said, I, I'm, I'm a nobody. 
and I come from a long line of nobodies. My family is the weakest family. Our clan is the smallest clan. Uh, we don't have the ability to do that. You don't know. Now, it's interesting because uh, as we look at this, in reality, uh, Gideon's clan and family was not an insignificant family. We know that he possessed land, so they had uh, at least wealth, and they probably also had political clout that would go with that wealth. He possessed wealth, and his family had at least 10 servants. We know that because next week when we take a look at what happens next week, uh, Gideon had 10 servants, and he probably had more than 10 servants because he, he brought the 10 that he knew he could trust to help him out with his job. Uh, but oftentimes, we believe these things, uh, what Satan says about us, or what we say about ourselves, oftentimes what we've looked at from the past or what other people have told us about ourselves, and we take those to heart and we believe those about ourselves. And then when God says, I have a purpose and a plan for you, we say, oh, yeah, but that's not for me. That might be for the person sitting next to me. That might be for the person down the road. That's not for me for who I am. I appreciate this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. What does it say? It says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame those that are wise, and God has chosen the weak things to shame those who are mighty. We begin to look at this idea of who we think we are. I, I listed down here some of the lies I think that Satan tells us about ourselves, but he does so for the purpose of keeping us from serving God. He says this, that you are n nothing more than your past and your failure. Somebody will say, well, Pastor, you don't know where I've come from. That may be true. I can tell you this, that God's grace and God's mercy is greater than your past. And wherever you've come from, God is greater than that, that he can still continue to use you regardless of what the past has been. His forgiveness cleanses us from all sin. Uh, you might say, well, you don't know uh, what abilities I have. I, I'm, and we kind of fill in the blank, right? I am not, I'm not strong enough to do this job. I, like I, that's for somebody else who's a little bit better than I am. I'm not uh, pretty enough for this. I, I'll never have that because I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have whatever blank enough is. That we don't have the ability to do it. I believe that that's a lie that Satan uses to keep us there under his thumb. Why would God ever use somebody like you? Have we ever heard that? Have we ever believed that? The idea is this, is that you are not enough. And we understand this, right? Yes, we are not enough in and of ourselves, but this is not what we're getting to. The point is this. It's not about us. It's about God. What has God said about us? And what God said about us is the truth, not what we believe about ourselves. And we need to change some of these things that we believe about ourselves and stop getting our identity from what other people have said about us or what we think about ourselves or what the world says about us. We need to get our identity from who Jesus Christ says that we are. Uh, you've not done enough to earn the approval of God. And we think that we have to earn God's approval. God doesn't like us unless we're doing something. You know, we do that sometimes in salvation, that we think, well, I've got to earn my salvation, but sometimes even after our salvation, right? We, I've got to make sure that God's happy with me, that I'm earning God's approval. And we understand that because that's what happens in our boss, right? Our, we've got to make sure we work hard enough to keep our boss happy so that, we, you know, we're going to get the raise. And we're going to get, uh, we oftentimes experience that maybe in some of our human relationships, that we tried earning the approval of our parents, uh, of, our, of our friends. We had to do these things to earn their approval. And so oftentimes we interpret that same thing to God that we don't understand that we're accepted not because of what we do. We're accepted because of who Jesus Christ is. And God cannot love you any more than he loves you right now. And he's demonstrated that by what he's done there through Jesus Christ. We never approach God on the basis of what we've done. Here's the good news. When we approach God in that place of humility, that we understand who we are and we come to God, God gives us the strength. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 would say, I glory in my infirmities and weaknesses, for when I am weak, then I am strong. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. We believe the lies that Satan says about us. It brings us to the second part here is this. We need to understand this. Who does God say that I am? And so what we think about ourselves or what others think about ourselves is really not important. It's insignificant. We need to stop paying attention to that. Instead, we need to ask the question, who does God say that I am? 
And so when you come back to this passage here, who did God say that Gideon was? Now, notice it is in contradiction to what the circumstances are telling us. We know that Gideon is afraid, right? And we know that he believes that he is insignificant. But what does God say about him? God says, you are a mighty man of valor. Our identity should come not from our circumstances or what people have said, but our identity should come from who God says that we are. Now, we understand that oftentimes we have to believe this and claim this in faith because our, our emotions haven't lined up with that yet, right? But we live in a world today that values what we call self-esteem. Now, we understand this. If our esteem or our view of ourself is grounded in self, it's probably on shaky grounds, right? The exercise that you're taught to do is to go stand in front of the mirror and to say, you are good, you are loved, you are enough. And the problem is, is we know ourselves. And so we know that that's not really true. We don't really believe it. Rather than that, let us just say, God loves you. You are forgiven. You are accepted. You are a child of God. We draw our identity from who God says that we are rather than from a value that we put in ourselves. The value comes from what God's put in us and what he's declared about us and what he has given to us. Our identity is drawn from Jesus Christ. And so if our identity is drawn from Jesus Christ, what I encourage you to do is rather than standing in front of the mirror and saying, you know, you are good, you are loved, you're not, begin to write scripture verses of the truth of who he says he is. And if you were to put those on post-it notes, you better have a big mirror because it's going to take up a lot of that mirror. But we need to remind ourselves of these things, that this is the truth that God has said about us. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, you're a child of God, here are some of the things that God has said about you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, he says that you are forgiven. All of your past is forgiven. Um, 2 Peter 1, 3, you are born again. First, uh, or, sorry, in John chapter 1, verse 12, that you are a child of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, that you are a saint. And you say, I know for some of you that may be a little bit of a stretch there, but that's what God has said, that you are a saint. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, right? There is no condemnation, that we're not under condemnation there in Jesus Christ. Uh, second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, that we are God's temple. There, Romans chapter 6, verse 22, that we are a servant of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, that we are an ambassador for Christ, that he has entrusted us there to be his representative here in this world. Romans chapter 8, verse 37, that we are more than a conqueror. Whatever we're facing, we can uh, be more than a conqueror there through Jesus Christ and the love that we are never separated from. There. Uh, and first, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, that we are alive in Christ, that we have spiritual life that's given to us there by Jesus Christ. The, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, that we have an inheritance in Jesus Christ. That we have an inheritance that is reserved for us, that we are wealthy because of who Jesus Christ is. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, right? That we are accepted. Oftentimes we struggle and wrestle with that in the world today, and we want to be accepted by our friends or our family, or our co-workers. Greater than that, we have been accepted in Jesus Christ, that we are accepted. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we are a new creation. First John chapter 3 verse 1, that I am loved by God. Matter of fact, we can continue to go on. This is just a sampling of some of the truth that God says of who we are. And what we need to do is we need to discern and discover our identity from the word of God of who we are in Jesus Christ. And we allow Jesus Christ to give us our identity. If we can see our identity in Jesus Christ, then secondly, we can fulfill our mission that he's called us to do. Amen. The mission that he had called Gideon to do there is this, right? Verse 14, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent you? Verse 16, he repeats that, and surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And so he says, here's the mission. I'm giving you a mission. Now, it's interesting. Notice, how would Gideon be victorious in the mission that God has called him to do? What you'll notice is this. What he's saying is, you'll be victorious in the mission because I, God, am with you. You can go out and defeat them. You can accomplish this purpose and you can accomplish this mission because you don't do it alone and you don't do it in your own strength. I am with you. I am giving you that strength. 
And so what's our mission that we're called to do? Right? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You should hopefully know this one by memory, but I, just to make sure I'll get it right, I'll, I'll read it for you here. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We too, just like Gideon, have been given a mission. Our purpose is given to us by God, and we're to fulfill that mission and that purpose. Part of that mission that we're called to do is to share this good news of Jesus Christ together with all the people who have never heard. We're called to that purpose, to that mission that's given to us by God. But the good news is we can be successful because God is with us. We need to focus on who God is rather than focusing on what's going on around us. We need to derive our identity from Jesus Christ of what he said about us. Thirdly, we need to understand who it is that is saying it. Who is the one who called him? And this is an interesting, if you come here uh, to Judges chapter 6, uh, you encounter here this person, the angel of the Lord. Now, if you are a student of Scripture, you understand that there is a difference, it's, uh, uh, kind of a, a distinction between an angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord. And when we come here, we understand that this angel of the Lord is different from just a regular angel. Matter of fact, if you were reading in your passage and you were paying attention, you would notice that the language that was being used kind of distinguishes this from a regular angel. This is the angel of the Lord, or what we often call in big you know, $5 words is a theophany. And a theophany is uh, the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. What that means is that this is Jesus Christ appearing uh, here in, uh, to those on earth before he was born in Bethlehem. And so this is Jesus Christ. Now, how, how can you say that this is Jesus Christ? Well, look at the passage, right? And there in verse 12, we have the angel of the Lord appeared to him, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon gives his response there in verse 13. Notice what it says there in verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him. Now, who turned to him? The angel of the Lord. The Lord. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel. Uh, and so we often, because the language is pointing out that this is more than just an angel, this is God. How do we also know this is more than just an angel? We can tell by his behavior. Okay, because uh, Gideon finally says, Okay, this is the mission that you've called me to do. Uh, please stay here and show me a sign. And one of the things that he wants to do is he wants to uh, share dinner with him. And so the angel says, all right, I'll stay. So he goes off, he prepares a meal, the goat, the, the cakes, the broth. He brings it out. The angel says, put it on the rock. He puts it on the rock. The angel takes his staff. And what happens? Fire comes up out of the rock. What is it pointing at? It's pointing at the sacrifice. What's being offered here is a sacrifice. And that sacrifice was accepted by God because fire consumed the sacrifice. And then, as fire's consuming the sacrifice, what happens to the angel of the Lord? He's there one moment, he disappears. He disappears up into the fire there, and Gideon realizes this. Right? What's Gideon's response? Gideon is afraid because now he's going to die. Because no man can see the face of God and live. Right? That comes to us there from Exodus. And so, uh, he's afraid now that he's going to to die, and God speaks to him. So it points out to us this fact, right? Uh, that this angel is none other than God himself who has appeared. And that's good news for us, because as we talk about this ministry, we talk about this purpose, this mission that we've been called to do, we might be tempted to think that we do it in our own strength, right? That I'm going to go out and share the gospel. I'm, just, I'm not really sure I'm smart enough to do that, because like, what happens if somebody asks a question I don't know the answer to? Or, or what happens if they get angry and upset at me and I just, I don't, I don't think I can do it. Well, here's the good news, right? You don't do it alone. You do it with Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, right? There in verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them. We know this again is a great commission, but I want you to focus on that part that reminds us we don't go alone. All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And notice the promise at the end. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Wherever you go, however long it takes, know this, I'm with you. 
it's good news for us. I don't know about you, but I know this, that um, one of the difficult things about being in ministry is this, is that I don't have the power to change people. Um, we, we've often shared this before, that be, sometimes before I came into ministry, I worked with wood and carpentry, and uh, you know, the nice thing about working with wood and carpentry is when, you know, a two-by-four doesn't go into the place that it's supposed to do, usually what you do is you just get the hammer out and you beat it into place. And one way or the other, we're going to make that two-by-four go right to where it's supposed to go, and uh, we're going to make it happen. What's wor- frustrating about working with people is oftentimes we can identify there's a problem in somebody's life. We know the way to help them to get to where they want to get to and the way that they should get to, and we can share with them, here's what you need to do, here's what God said, here's how you need to do it, and you know what happens? They go back out and they do the same stupid thing that they did that got them in the flat problem in the first place. You're like, I want to smack you, and I'm not allowed to do that. For some reason, the deacons won't let me. It, it, um, I don't have the power to change people, and you might be in that same situation, right? You might be thinking, man, if only God would show up and work with my spouse, because they're, I mean, like they, they really need God in their life right now. And uh, you don't have the power to change them. You might be looking at your coworkers and saying, man, I, I, I know what you need, and I know how to get you there, but if you just would listen to... And they, the only person that has the power to change people that we know is Jesus Christ. We, we can look at those that are broken hearts and broken lives, and, and we can even point them to the truth, we can lead them to the truth, but only Jesus Christ has the power to change people. But here's the good news, right? We don't go in our power. We go in his power, and he is always with us. The Lord's saying to Gideon, Gideon, I'm calling you to this mission. You're going to defeat the Midianites. I, you're going to have this victory, but here, you're going to do it because I'm with you. You're not doing it alone. If, you, if you've read ahead a little bit in the story, you know that Gideon did not do it because he was a great, mighty warrior. He did not do it because he had the best battle strategy and plan. Gideon experienced victory because God was with him, and God structured it to make sure that Gideon knew that. The good news is the one who goes with us has the power to do what he's calling us to do. Secondly, when we know Jesus, we have peace that comes from God. The great part of this story is this, is as Gideon offers that food there to the angel of the Lord and he puts it there on the rock, uh, the angel of the Lord touches it with his staff, consumes it, the angel of the Lord disappears, Gideon is afraid. Right? It, it comes there from the story, remember when God is talking with uh, Moses, and Moses says, Lord, I, I want to see you, and the Lord says to Moses, no man can see my face and live. And so here's what I'll do, I'll, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll let my hind parts go past you. And when Moses came down from that experience, his face was shining with the glory of God. Even Moses, for all that he did, for all of who he was, did not have the ability to look on the face of God. And, and so it reminds us that we serve a holy God, right? We, we cannot stand in the presence of God unless we're changed. Jesus Christ gives us the power to change. He gives us his righteousness. We can't stand in our own righteousness. Uh, and so Gideon's afraid. I've now seen God face to face. I'm going to die. And that's a, I think it's a wise thing, right? We, we've often, we talk about this, and, and you might think, um, uh, sometimes people will say, and we, we, we've mentioned this before, only God can judge me. You want to be careful of that because God judges with a holy, righteous judgment. And, and we don't want God to judge us with justice because if we do, we're condemned for eternity in hell. We can't stand in the holiness of God. I, I always reminds me there, of, you may have seen the Indiana Jones and the Ark of the Covenant there. And they, If you've ever watched that movie, they try and uncover the Ark and look inside the Ark. And, and uh, Indy is there to make sure, like, don't look right now, because at that moment, the angel of death comes through. And it reminds us there of the holiness of God. I don't think that the, probably the creators of Indiana Jones appreciated greatly the holiness of God, but it reminds us there of the holiness of God, that we cannot stand in the presence of the holiness of God on our own. But God is for us, right? Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. God is for us, 
He's not against us. God is a God of peace who wants peace. And so he has provided everything that is necessary for us to have peace with God. Notice that's what happens. Gideon's afraid. He, he believes in any moment he's going to die. And it's the voice of the Lord that speaks to him and says, right? Verse 23, peace be with you. You do not, uh, do not fear. You shall not die. And Gideon's response was a response of worship. He built an altar, and he named that altar there Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. You might turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. The good news that we have is this, is that we can experience both peace with God and peace of God because of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our peace and is the one who has atoned for our sins so that we can be righteous in the sight of God. He's given us his righteousness that we accept by faith. And when we do so, we can experience peace. We too, just like Gideon, can understand the Lord is our peace, that he himself has come and secured peace with God for us so that we can be at peace with God and we can experience his peace. Colossians chapter 1 there, verse 20, right? For by him to reconcile all things by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus reminds us that God is for us. Yes, he is a holy God. He will never tolerate sin. Because he is holy, he will judge sin. But, because he also is for you and is a God of peace, he has provided a means of salvation in the person of Jesus Christ who has secured peace with God for us that we can receive by faith. He has done it all. We receive it as a gift by faith because our God is a God of peace. Brings me to these three challenges that I want to leave you with here today. The first challenge is this. What lie have you been holding on to that is holding you back from living for Jesus. There's something that Satan has told you, maybe he's used a painful experience in the past, maybe it's something else, that, but, but it's deeply ingrained in there. But in reality, it's not who God has said you are, it's a lie that Satan has used you to hold you back. God's got plans for you to use you, and he wants to use you in a powerful way to fulfill his purpose and his mission that he's told you to. And you've been kind of saying, like, I, just, I don't think I can because you don't know. Let go of that lie and believe what Jesus Christ has said about you. Number two is this. What do you need to believe that Jesus says to become who you are in Christ? The truth has already been spoken over you by Jesus Christ. It is a reality. Just as Gideon was already a mighty man of valor even when he was in the wine press. The same is true of you, because our identity is given to us by Jesus Christ. Now, whether we live out of that identity, that's a different story. What do you need to believe, what Jesus Christ says about you, so that you can begin to live out of the identity that Jesus Christ has already given to you? And then thirdly is this, who is God calling you to tell about Jesus Christ, knowing that Jesus Christ is you? We too have a mission. And the good news is we don't go alone. Jesus Christ goes with us. He's already provided the peace that we can share with others. We need to share it and tell others about it. Who is God calling you to tell today? Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you that Jesus Christ is our peace. That he has offered himself as a sacrifice to pay the price of our sin so that he can give us his righteousness and we can be at peace with God. We know that God is for us because of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. God, we pray that you would help us to see the truth of who you say we are, to stop believing the lies of what we have interpreted to ourselves or what others have said, and instead to receive our identity from Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, to live out of that identity on a moment-by-moment, day-by-day basis. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to ask you to stand together here. We're going to sing a song of invitation. As we sing that song of invitation, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you've never experienced His peace, we'd love to invite you to know today how you can experience His peace. If you want to come to the altar and to pray and there's something that 
uh, you just want to lay down there at the altar. Maybe it's one of those lies that you just want to lay there at the altar and, and to go back and say, God, I'm going to commit to believing the truth. Or there's some other spiritual decision that God is calling you to make. You respond as God calls you to respond together this morning. Hymn 439. Out of my body. Sorrow and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness, and light, Jesus, I come to thee. I into thy health out of my one and into thy wealth out of my sin and into thyself Jesus I come to thee out shameful failure and loss Jesus I come Jesus I come into the glorious gain of thy cross Jesus I come to Distress to jubilant song, Jesus, I come to thee. Lord, we thank you for the truth that you speak over us. God, we pray that you would help us to have ears to hear and hearts to believe that truth. Lord, we speak in a world that is clamoring with noise. God, it often speaks speaks that louder than your still small quiet voice. But God, help us to tune out that noise and to focus in on you. Lord, may we come to you today and believe what you said about us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll take your seats for just a moment here this morning. Share with you a couple of announcements of what's going on. Um, one is our offering there, and uh, I know some of you had that state mission offering there, uh, there today, and I, I'm blessed to see that. And so uh, one of the offerings that we participate here, particularly in the month of September, is the state mission offering. It, it's a special offering that goes to reach the state of Indiana uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, none of that stays here at the church. That gets passed on to our state convention. That's our mission partner or, uh, organization here in the state of Indiana. Uh, and that goes to help planting churches. Uh, where those needs are identified, it goes to help supporting our campground and the camping ministry uh, that is used. In, it goes to help ministry here within the state. And so if you want to help to reach your uh, Judea, uh, our local community, not quite across the seas, but here in our local community as well as, uh, you can participate there in that and, and be praying there about that. Um, and so I, I think, it, I don't have to tell it, you already know that, but there's offering boxes that are, are both out here in the hallway and, and also down there in the foyer as well as you get ready to go. And you can just put that envelope as well as your regular tithes and offerings in there as well. Uh, some of the things that are happening here, uh, October 4th, uh, Women's Bible Study is getting ready. They're getting ready to start the Women's Bible Study again. That'll be taking place. There is a sign-up sheet there for that. And um, I'm trying to think the title of the study, and my brain is not working Talk to Rachel, she will be able to tell you the title of the study. <laughs> it was a good one, I, I remember that. <laughs> um, then September uh, 22nd is See You at the Pole. It's a great way 
to live out your faith there on school campuses. And so at the flagpoles before school, there's events that are taking place where prayer will be happening there at the flagpoles. And so that's the September 22nd. And then tonight, I believe it's bonfire at the Doobie. So it, it, talk to Pastor Brian there about that for our youth uh, there as well. We're glad to have you here with us today. We're glad to have, uh, I know some have come from long distances to have, so it's good to have Debbie here with us. Debbie Hawkins as well uh, has been able to fly in, and we're glad to have her as well. Uh, so it's a blessing to have you. I always appreciate when people show up at church. It's a, it's a discouraging thing to preach to an empty building. Uh, let me leave you with our blessing this morning, Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you today. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed.